Okay. Okay. It's live. Uh, hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And today I'm going to begin uh, a character study on Noah. Uh, I've already done the character studies on uh, uh, Adam and Eve and Satan, the devil. But uh, I'm trying to work my way through the scriptures kind of like in sequence. The, the next major character is that I see is, is Noah. There's a lot of other characters between, uh, you know, uh, Adam and Eve uh, uh, being kicked out of the garden and also uh, and, and Noah, but I think Noah's the next main character. Oh, uh, Brother Sam, how are you doing? Oh, good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Uh, how about you? Oh, good. Um, I'm sorry. I just kind of, you know, came in the middle of your thing. But, uh, oh, that's all right. Uh, I only started like 30 seconds before you got here. So I was, just, right. I was just introducing the, uh, the subject. Well, who's this strange character that's just joined us? You must kick him right now because he is trolling. I got to get rid of that guy fast, man. Whatever he is. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. You can't get rid of me. Is that some kind of like animated type of thing you're doing there, or are you actually moving like that? No, it's an animated thing. If I was doing like that, I'd have cramp because I've been doing that all day and all night and all day. Yeah. Uh, I, um, is there some, is some way you can put up your old saintly picture up there or something? Because I, I have motion sickness. That's the truth. Uh, anytime I'm moving like that, it just, I actually start, my stomach gets sick immediately. I have to close my eyes. I can't look at it. I don't know what to do about that. That's the truth. I got to close my eyes when I talk. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I can't really look. Uh, Hang on, I've got my Google Plus, see if I can do something, but hang on. Yeah, okay, all right. Um, all right, well, uh, Brother Sam and Brother Bill, um, we're going to begin studying Noah today. And all I've got is uh, a Bible Hub. I just typed in the name Noah, and I found all the different occurrences of the name. And we're going to look at each occurrence of the name Noah in the Scriptures, and we're going to go kind of in order. Uh, so um, once Brother Bill is ready, we'll get get started on that. But uh, if you want to follow along, you can use Bible Hub and do the same thing I am. Or, uh, of course, I'll tell you the, the verse each time. Uh, the first one we're going to do is Genesis 5.29. And let me wait. Some way I can stop that picture. I can't. Uh, I can't really even concentrate. Hmm. I'm trying to get. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get rid of it now. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm on. I can hardly even speak. For some reason, it's like really affecting me. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Hey, brother Bill. I think you better turn the camera on. It's giving him motion sickness. You know what? Maybe we can put a thumb on it. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not only was it making me actually physically ill to my stomach, but I, I couldn't concentrate on anything else. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, before we go into uh, Noah, uh, let me just ask you guys to say hi to everybody. Introduce yourself, starting with Brother Sam. Hi, uh, I'm Sam. Uh, green egg is in ham. <laughs> Sometimes Uncle Sam. But my channel is Thick Shades. Uh, you can get there by thickshades.com or youtube.com slash thickshades. Um, I'm glad to, uh, you know, join into this new study about Noah. Um, I believe it was, he was called Noah in Old Testament. And then um, he was called Noe. In New Testament, I think so. But hopefully, that uh, we'll be able to explore 
uh, this righteous man who walked with God and actually eventually uh, ultimately our ancestor you know of all mankind so hopefully uh, the, uh, the study will be awesome but I'm just um, I, I'm sorry to say that I cannot stay that long but I kind of prematurely set up my own hangout about an hour later so I can only stay for an hour but the, hopefully the study will be very in, in, enriching and edifying thank you all right, brother. Thanks. Uh, the uh, yeah, the uh, uh, it is uh, I guess helpful to note that uh, for everybody to understand that uh, Noah is the great 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 grandfather of every one of us. <laughs> so, um, all right, uh, brother Bill, want to say hi? Yep. Hello. Oh, yep. Yep. It's uh, the Panda Man evangelist, and you're actually seeing me in the flesh today because my icon was making Luke feel sick. So, sorry about that, but yeah, and you can tell by my name, I like to evangelize, so yeah, and also I would like to have a laugh as well, forgive me. Yeah, well, uh, it's far better for me to say that that icon was making me sick, instead of me saying this actual uh, video of you makes me sick, because now I'm happy, I'm really happy to see you, you don't make me sick, just that funny icon you had up there. All right, brother. Uh, okay, let's look at the first uh, occurrence of the word um, or name Noah. I'm going to go to uh, Genesis 5:29, and it says, uh, "And he named him Noah, saying, This same will comfort us in our work and in the toil of our hands, because of the ground which Yahweh has cursed." Uh, so this is the very first time we see the name Noah. Uh, I'll give a little context here. Uh, Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. Now he called his name Noah, saying, This one will give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Verse 30, Then Lamech lived 595 years after he became the father of Noah, and he had other sons and daughters. Um, all right, so that's the introduction to the, uh, the to the character Noah, the son of Lamech. Uh, Brother Sam, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, it's basically, uh, you know, um, you know, explain to us how, you know, basically things will end, but, you know, how things will start as well. Um, how we have been um, uh, along, from Adam and Eve all, all the way to Noah and how we came about. And um, uh, it seems like uh, to me that um, Noah... Uh, was chosen for for you know this purpose we all know which is the flood but you know why he picked him among all all other population I think that's something to uh, to you know good to explore as well you, know, you gotta unmute yourself okay uh, <laughs> I'm uh... This, this verse doesn't really tell us a whole lot here, but I've, I've really, of course, never noticed this or paid any attention to it. It says, this same, referring to Noah, shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. So, um, Brother Bill, uh, can you talk about Noah related to what it says there? Yeah, yeah. Well, to me, I, I think there's a, quite a lot in that verse, and that that you know, because God initially cursed the ground for man's sake, and we don't know how big the forms and the briars are and all the issues you know what were going on, on on the planet Earth at that time. But it seems that, that after God flooded the Earth, He cleansed you know the almost the most of the curse off the land because it says that you know. The stone shall comfort us concerning our work, and so it's as if the, the, what God is about to do 
through Noah, you know, because Noah was part of it. Is he? Being saved. Turn that shower off was going to be a comfort. All right, uh, Brother Sam, do you want to say anything about this verse further before right, we move on to the next one? Right, I mean, it clearly uh, points again to, uh, obviously, uh, Jesus Christ. Um, and um, hopefully that uh, will be rest in Christ, basically. Um, so, kind of excited to see, you know, again, like, you know, many characters in, this, in the scripture uh, actually you know, walk with God and, and, you know, had that close relationship with God. And I am very uh, excited to see, you know, how Noah actually uh, did so. So when it says, like, when God said, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our, our, of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So, you know, basically he knows what uh, God has prepared for, for him. And, and basically through him, uh, such a comfort, uh, like, you know, like Jesus Christ, uh, the work of God will will come about. I think that's you know giving basically bottom line uh, so called prophecy in short. All right, uh, let's go to the next verse uh, that uh, we see the name Noah appear. That we, that's uh, Genesis three, I mean five thirty two. It says Noah was five hundred years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham and Japheth. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing Japheth. I've heard it pronounced several different ways. Uh, so um, look at that in context too. Uh, uh, so all the days of Lemek were 777 years and he died. Noah was 500 years old and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So it looks like right now we're really uh, going through some kind of a genealogical um, uh, explanation of these people. Uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, uh, his three sons, are going to be very interesting as we get further along and they, they become more prominent, but right now they're introduced. All right, anything to say about that before we go on? No, I think that's pretty much clear. <laughs> it's just kind of laying out, you know, what the, it's kind of like a summary in a way, so. Yeah, but I, I don't know if you wanted to go into what the names actually mean, because they, they have got meanings, you know, Shem, Ham, and Jake. But did, you want, did you want me to explain what they mean? Yeah, I'd love Basically. to hear I'd love to hear yeah, Basically, we have Shem, all right, which means dusky, all right. Japheth means fair, and then we have after that we have Ham, which means to be hot. So you know, perhaps there's some significance in that, you know. But you know, Japheth was the fair one, Shem was dusky, and the you know, Ham was hot. What does dusky mean? Does it, well, I, well, I suppose when you look at the dusk, you know, dawn or dusk, perhaps it, the, the, the coloration of his skin was a dusky colour, and Jacob was a fair colour, and obviously uh, Ham was like a reddish colour perhaps, I don't know, but it's just interesting that their names have got meanings, you know, it's not just picked out of the air just because they sounded good, that, that's what I find interesting. Well, one thing about the Bible names, uh, it's always, I'm kind of confused. I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg, uh, because a character has a name, for example, Jacob. And Jacob means like tricky, one's like a schemer, tricky. tricky. Uh, so, and we know that that's how he was. That actually describes his character. 
uh, and on and on we can give we can give probably a hundred examples like this but you have a name and it actually describes a lot about that person and yet if they got that name at birth was it like prophetic that this person would be like that that's why they're named that way or maybe the name came later because of how they were and then that name was attached but I, I think the names were given to them at birth uh, have you ever wondered about that I can relate to that because um, you know I have Korean name and it means bright star <laughs> basically like you know how they name their uh, like in Native American for example they uh, they named their kids in a special way you know uh, it usually it has certain meaning I don't know about in English like for example if I were to uh, I call someone Jake I have no idea what that means for example uh, in Western name I think most of them are names just for calling sake but without you know without meanings or uh, or lost the meaning uh, but uh, as far as Asian culture is concerned, still we give our children names with certain meanings. So um, I think uh, in all days, I think it was even more important and prevalent at that time. And so the genealogy and all that, the meaning of their names, uh, it's not something so light to, uh, to consider. It, it's it has quite a uh, significant meaning throughout, uh, including even in the scripture, you know. So that's why it is so important uh, to know the meaning of these uh, guys' names and how <laughs> how it starts from Adam and Eve. And you guys know about the meaning of all these guys. So, yeah, I think Noah, I think it was about salvation, something like that. But in any way, yeah, it is very important. And just know that my name in Korean, the meaning of it is called uh, a bright star. Not brightest one, obviously, but a bright star. That's good, <laughs> as long as it's bright. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, uh, now, Bill, you you introduced the, the whole idea of uh, defining these names of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But I'm wondering, do you, do you have the... Explanation of the name Noah. Uh, not not a hand, no. But there is in a book, and it's probably online as well, that mentions that to say like all the way from Christ and how there's significant characters that means their names. And that's quite interesting. I think uh, Chuck Mislock uh, wrote it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you think of the idea that I put forth here about the names um, all have a meaning and it seemed like every character in the Bible that their name actually describes them and it's an accurate description so how did they get that name was it was it kind of prophetic that they were given the name know it someone knew ahead that that's what they're going to be like well, it could be yeah well yeah God obviously knew things anyway because like you might earlier, you had because uh, Jacob, well, obviously becomes Israel. Uh, Jacob is a form of James, and that means the, the supplanter, you know. But then obviously wrestled with God, and then it was you know changed to Israel. But God obviously knew what was going to happen, so this is what happened. But yeah. Okay, let's go to the next verse. Uh, the next occurrence would be uh, Genesis 6, 8. Uh, but Noah found favor in Yahweh's eyes, in God's eyes. Let me look at the verses before and after. It says, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Um, so Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord in uh, Genesis 6, 8. Sam? Still there, Sam? 
I'm, I'm sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I, I don't know which version that uh, you were reading, but uh, in King James it says, uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, you know, I mean, obviously he's... Uh, he has done something good, <laughs> but whatever whatever he has done, whether that's good or bad, I guess his heart was uh, in the right place. Uh, we know during this time that um, the uh, you know things were quite evil. That people, uh, whatever thinking, everything was continuously evil. Whatever they do was continuously evil. Meaning. Um, Whatever there was no good, there was nothing good. But so uh, when it's written, Noah found grace in the Lord in, in the eyes of the Lord. So it's just basically uh, saying that hey, Noah is the only one, only only perfect and righteous in his generation. Uh, just like in uh, verse nine elaborates why he was found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse nine. These are the generation of Noah, and, and, and then it explains Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. So that's why, you know. So uh, if we are uh, claimed righteous, meaning that we trust and believe on Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ, we would be sanctified and justified and, and declared righteous and just like uh, what the verse 90 space was saying and from that on we can walk with God have uh, and have that particular very special relationship with God and that's what Noah was actually and a just man and, and, and perfect in his generation being found great in the eyes of the Lord mm -hmm. yeah the uh, I don't know what translation that was but I've got the parallel parallel translations now and and I'll read various ones real quick Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord Noah found favor with the Lord Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord uh, Noah found face it grace in the eyes of the Lord uh, the Lord was pleased with Noah so uh, uh, it's it's clear that uh, for some reason uh, it, God was pleased with Noah, and so he uh, apparently uh, he he was maybe the only person or one of the few, only people on the world that that was uh, you know uh, probably esteemed God and was was thinking about God, wanted a relationship with God. It seems like from everything else I understand at that time that it was. Uh, the world was pretty just, just not interested. It kind of like what we we see today. You know, much of the world is not interested in God at all anymore. Okay, let's go to the uh, the next uh, verse we see, and it's uh, Genesis six nine. Oh, okay, we already said that. Did that one six ten. Uh, Noah became the father of three sons: Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 6.13 says, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them in the earth. Uh, so this is uh, when, when God first tells Noah that he's going to destroy the world. I think also the translation... Uh, I think it's a little off too. It says, "I will destroy them with the earth, not in the earth." Um, when you say, "I will destroy them in the earth," that means the earth won't be destroyed, but um, but whatever in it will only those will be destroyed. What about the uh, um, uh, you know with the earth? So yeah, uh, it's, a little, it's a little thing, but uh, translation is a little. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know on this. Uh, I'm going to put the I'm going to put the link on the chat area, and you can you can click that one, and it'll also give you the uh, passages and uh, verses with with Noah in it, 
uh, in King James. Okay. Um, now I've got it here in King James, and as a matter of fact, what I need to do is just jump ahead to this portion of the page anyway, because it shows me King James, uh, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Another one that's interesting is, is Holman, a uh, Christian Standard Bible. It says, I, I'm going to destroy them along with the earth. Uh, I don't know which one I read originally, but I'll try not to read that one next time because, it, <laughs> right, it's, it's, it's whatever one of translation was is flawed, I think. Or you, right. found, you found both times I read something, you're, there's something that is not quite right. <laughs> right. Very good, very good. You're paying good attention there. All right, let's go to now uh, the uh, six, uh, six, uh, Genesis 6.22. Yeah, Noah does Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. That's awesome, huh? <laughs> how can anyone, how can anyone do all that God commands? It's like something, something, he, he, I mean, he, he was quite a special man, that's for sure, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're of course we're going to find out later as we go along in the study about Noah that even Noah, even David, even all everybody, every character in the Bible, the only one I can't I can think of that there's nothing negative said is basically is Enoch, I guess, um, and Melchizedek. But um, the uh, it seems like every character, no matter how good they are, they really screw up in, in eventually. And Noah, we find out he got screwed up with his his drunkenness. Um, All right. I mean, you know, but um, yeah, we'll discuss about that probably hopefully later. Um, um, yeah, but I have a little different opinion on that. But uh, yeah, that, that's that would be cool. Even that, I think I think that's justified. But I, I'll probably express my opinion at that time. Okay, let's go to uh, uh, Genesis seven one, uh, and uh, it says. Um, why don't you read it in the King James first, and I'll look at these others. So, uh, Genesis 7, 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. So, you know, God is uh, elabor re elaborating, restating. And so, you know, he's making quite sure that Noah was quite a righteous man. Uh, in that particularly in that uh, generation yeah uh, well because I'm just looking at the occurrences of the name Noah between the last two verses a lot of a lot of history happened and <laughs> we skipped it but that's oh, when oh, that's when God, God commanded him to build the ark and it took a hundred right. years and everybody was mocking him all that time and uh, now we were at the point where they uh, the Lord is saying to enter into the into the ark. Right. Now, of course, entering into the ark, uh, the important thing about that is that we uh, we know that that's like entering into salvation. Right. That uh, and. I, I guess the, the ark was available to other people too if they wanted to, but I guess the whole world was just everybody that came across knowing what he was doing just mocked him. But uh, just oh, knowing his family entered in, but everybody could have entered in, and there was just one doorway to get in. Right. I mean, animals came in. Why can't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All these animals were entering in. I mean, that should have been a real clue to the world. So if they're observing that Noah is diligent, he's determined, he's working so hard for 120 years, building, and I'm sure preaching during all that time, giving out a warning, and, and all these people who are observing him, and then they finally see all these animals coming in, all mm -hmm. kinds of animals. That should have made a light bulb go off in their head and think, well, wait a second, uh, I better start believing this guy, but they didn't. Right. Yeah. And we see that all of, a lot, a lot these days, even. <laughs> yeah. The same thing. And then yeah. we know that 
it, when you they entered into that ark, that was the only thing, only thing that could save people. Mm -hmm. There he is again. All of that because they didn't believe. Could you turn your camera on, Bill? Brother Bill, welcome back. Are you able to turn your camera on? <laughs> now, if you can hear us. Yeah. <laughs> I can hear again. My internet went down. I lost sky. I lost the internet and everything. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're back, but could you please turn your camera on? Can you not? You shouldn't, you shouldn't have that horrible face now. Is it still yeah, there? Yeah, it's uh, you still see that. It was, I think it's uh, it's in Brother uh, Luke's computer cache forever and ever. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. I, got it. I got it. If you can get your camera on, I'd appreciate it. Okay, that's better. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's much better. Thank you very much. Very much. You'll have to bear with me a second because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit behind now because the internet went down and I've just got to open some browsers up to, to find out where we are now. Are, are we on Genesis 6 now, are we? No, we've, we've gone way ahead now. We're on Genesis 7 1. We're talking about entering into the ark. Okay, okay. Yeah, we'll probably going to Genesis 7 5, right? Yeah. But uh, the idea of entering the ark, I think this is really, really important. I know that we, we're all familiar with the idea that entering into the ark was the only thing that could save anybody in the world. Nobody in the world could be saved any other way from that flood unless they entered the ark. So there's, there's only one way, just like Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Noah could easily said, uh, this is the only way. Enter the ark. This is the only way to escape the flood. You, this is it. either enter here or you die. And uh, so no one in his family entered in, and then they, they were saved. So entering into the ark is, is one of the greatest pictures of, of salvation, that there's one way. All you've got to do is enter. And, and when we put our faith in Jesus, we enter into his, his rest, and uh, it's as simple as entering. It's, they didn't have to uh, uh, do anything besides that to be saved. Uh, Brother Sam? Yes, exactly. Um, it's, um, we kind of, I, I guess it's all also, again, choice, your choice, I guess. You've got to make your own decision. Um, all, all the uh, animals are also going in, uh, why can't you go in? Why can't you make your decision? Uh, Mr. Atheist, Mrs. Uh, Atheist out there, you know, it's your, it's your choice. You are being just one of those guys who, who are just mocking and just watching uh, Noah building the ark, you know, and the, now the door is open. The animals are going in, the bars are flying in, and you are just sitting there and looking at it. You know, all a bunch of people all throughout the nation are being saved. No matter how you look, no matter what kind of background you have, no matter what kind of culture you have, what sort of stuff that you eat, all people are going in Christ, in the ark, and some fools out there just watching it, like a whole bunch of fools. That's what we are seeing. That's what we are going on these days as, as well, Brother Luke. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, if Brother Bill, if you're, if you're available, uh, you can comment yeah. on entering, entering into the ark as a picture of entering into salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Absolutely. And what, what I've highlighted as well, and I put it on the chat section, is, is Genesis oh, oh, 7, that. 16. That, that is actually yeah. fundamental. If we read it carefully, it says, and they that went in, went in male, female, of all flesh, all right, as God had commanded yeah. him, all right, and then it says, and the Lord shut him in. So well, it wasn't up to Noah, it wasn't up to his children, it wasn't up to his wife or anything else to, to shut themselves in and be secure, that was God himself that secured him in the ark, and that is a beautiful picture, you know, initially that God is saving these souls, in an ark, but that God Himself shuts it in and makes it waterproof. So it is a 
brilliant picture, I think, of eternal security right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, uh, there's also an explanation of the building of the ark being built with pitch. And there's a brother, Salam Kamara, who in England, he has a, he's a minister in England. Uh, he's called uh, London Baptist. And uh, he, 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 a couple of years ago, uh, he was explaining this to us in a hangout. Uh, and talking about the pitch, which I, I'm assuming it's true because I, I don't think he would have said it unless he was sure it was correct. But he said the pitch actually had blood in it. When they made the pitch, they put blood in it for some reason. And so it sealed. The ark was sealed airtight, you know, so that it, uh, it wouldn't sink with pitch, and the pitch contained blood. So when we enter into the ark, and where you enter into Jesus, it's a it's a picture of entering into this blood salvation, and that is and we're sealed as you said the door is shut the Lord shut it and sealed it, and uh, so it's that easy. You know a lot of people have said, well it's so easy to get saved. It's like it's like just taking a drink of water. Jesus said you know drink this living water. Uh, Jesus said eat. And, and it's it's just a picture of eating something. It's that easy. And then here in, in the ark, it, it's another illustration of how easy salvation is. All you've got to do is uh, understand that you're you're going to die unless you enter that. And so, if a person watching now understands that they're going to die the second death in the lake of fire, and they, but they could be escape that by entering into this ark, which is Jesus Christ. If we enter into him, then we're the door shut and we're sealed up until the day of redemption. So um, before we move on, if you want to say anything else about that, go ahead. Okay. All right, let's uh, move on to now. Uh, Uh, Genesis 7 5 Noah did everything that Yahweh commanded him or oh gosh what translation is that okay um, <laughs> 5 7 Genesis 5 7 and yeah. Noah, Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him mm -hmm. yeah and 5 6 I, you know you want me to continue with, um, in context or yeah, go ahead and give us some context, please. Okay. Um, it starts from, uh, I think in context, I think goes five, I mean, seven, four to six. For yet seven days, and I will cause it, rain, cause it to rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Verse five, and Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Six and Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. That's till verse six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or I I can read farther till verse eight if you want me to. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Verse seven and Noah went in. Uh, and his sons and his wife and his son's wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the, of the flood of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, uh, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark the male and the female, as God has commanded Noah. That's until last time. Yeah. Well, I th there are um, an awful lot of people that, uh, first of all, there's a group of people who are agnostic or atheists, and then the far extreme are the anti-theists, and and they would just laugh at this right now. They'd be laughing right at us and mocking us because we're we're uh, studying this with the, based on the premise that this is an actual literal account of history. 
and they think that number one, it never happened, and and if anything, you should take it allegorically rather than literally. But uh, there are allegories in the scriptures. We all know that. But then there, much of, of the scriptures is is a history book, and this is an actual historical account of what happened. So. That's how we read it. We accept that this is true, but then there are people that are, would argue, well, how could you fit all these animals, and how could you end up with all the animals today if everything was destroyed and all the species? So they come up with all these different arguments to try to debunk this, and yet the three of us and many people watching, uh, we, we accept this as a literal account. Oh, yeah, so of course. I mean, you know, uh, without the flood, you know, the fossil, the, the best amount of fossils, for example, those cannot be uh, explained. You know, any sort of fossilization, it is a scientific fact that uh, a rapid barrier is quite required for any organism to be fossilized. Otherwise, if you were to apply what we have learned throughout the textbook in public education, this sediment were to uh, you know settle on top of this dead organism, uh, which doesn't even make sense. That would only be possible like you know places where there is no scavengers, no microorganisms. I mean, if something is left, let's say for example in in, uh, in marine uh, life in the sea, if something is dead, that organism is very hard, uh, highly unlikely uh, it won't go to uh, waste. Most of the time, if hundred, if not hundred percent, nothing goes to waste in the ocean. So let's say, for example, if you find a fish fossil that is, as a whole, intact, not just fish bones, but the you know flesh outlines or body outlines or that. If we if we see that sort of fossils and majority of let's say fish fossils are like that, that only proves that there had been some sort of catastrophic. A very, um, you know, a, I mean, rapid, rapid barrier happened, and that's the fossils that you know we find, and it's like as if God took the picture of that moment in, in time, just like you know when we even discover uh, fish fossils eating another fish, <laughs> you know, those kind of things are quite impossible if we were to apply certain theory. Uh, that was that is put forth by some evolutionists, you know. So yes, of course, flood did happen, and the fossils are actually specifically, specifically like marine fossils, are actually the proof of the of the flood. Well, we are uh, we do accept this account as historical fact, and all all of it is true, uh, and we know that if the time was spent to study this uh, and, and look at the the proofs for it. Uh, Brother Sam just gave you one little illustration, but there's a lot that can be said. I mean, you could spend, you know, 10 or 20 hours uh, looking, analyzing it uh, from a scientific and, and archaeological point of view and to determine if you think there's proof. We, we believe there's proof. We're not just believing it based on just blind faith that we, well, it's in the Bible, it must be true. No, we've, we've studied. And I want everybody to, watch, know, um, to know who's watching right now that uh, not only this account of the flood, but all the other things in the scriptures uh, that um, people want to dis dispute as being maybe historically inaccurate or scientifically inaccurate, uh, they're wrong. It's, it's all accurate. It's all scientifically correct. It's it's all uh, historically correct, and the the proof, if you want it, we're not going to try to do it right now because we get distracted. But I have a playlist on my channel called Science, God, and the Bible, and I have well over a hundred videos that are all from scientists and archaeologists and, and many others that that are showing the evidence that the Bible is historically and scientifically correct. So the proof is there. We're not asking you just to have blind faith. No, it can be uh, proven, I think, through a rational mind. Brother Bill? Well, yeah, I did not say that for, you know, the average person on the street, you know, needs an element of faith to believe these things, which is always a good thing anyway. Faith is not always bad. It's a good thing. 
but there are there are a lot of you know scientists now who, who used to be evolutionists are now actually coming forward and, and agreeing because of all modern new science. You know, I don't, I'm going to use this word in a biblical sense and not a not a not a biological sense that that science is evolving and we have new sciences now that, that seem to prove that, that, that these accounts in the Bible are accurate. You know, there's plenty of websites, good websites. You've got Answers in Genesis and Grace and Research. You've got a lot of good, you know, websites out there. And, and they're, you know, they're putting forth the, these scientific claims. And I'm afraid, you know, for, for especially for the education system and, and everyone else, you know, it's a matter of catch-up, trying to catch up, you know, because the Darwinism has been taught for a long time. You know, it's it's outdated. It's not provable. Yet it's taught, and, and I suppose and I'm hoping, you know, if the Christ, you know, if Christ does tarry, that, that that these these new sciences will eventually be taught in schools, and people can you know make a you know qualified decision. But I do honestly believe that science is starting to prove that that the Genesis account is literal. You look, you look uh, especially holy, Brother Bill, today. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling holy today, yeah. I feel, yeah that's because my head stopped shaking. I feel more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you seemed really quite tense before, the way your body was like, you know, really uh, oscillating. <laughs> I got rid of that about an hour ago. And, and like I said, it must be in your, your catch, because that's gone, but how yeah. annoying. You look good with that hairstyle too. <laughs> yeah, well, it, I look good because it's just hair. I ain't got any, so anything will look good. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you ever want to know what, what you'd look like if with a full head of hair, now you know. <laughs> All right, let's move on to this next uh, portion. As um, let me see. Seven Eleven, <laughs> Genesis Seven Eleven. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventh day, 17th day on the, of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the deep, deep, great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. What a spectacular scene. All on the same day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, like during this time I kind of think that the uh, the environment at the time at this time was a little different than nowadays. And especially like some people kind of assert kind of greenhouse environment or like tropical environment uh, where uh, before never had any sort of heavy rain, uh, which is kind of understandable given if you have some kind of uh, canopy, if you were to uh, apply this canopy theory, um, that's probably one of the reasons why the environment at the time was all kind of different with a temperate uh, temperature, tropical, very, and a lot of things are thriving, a lot of oxygen, even uh, the pressure, like you are in a 24 hours hydro uh, hydraulic chamber. Um, um, so, you know, a lot of things were good, uh, but, you know, on that day, the same day, all of a sudden, it's just like when, when Christ said he would come like a thief. In just one day, <laughs> all the fountains of the great deep, meaning like from the abyss, cracked up and broken up, and the windows haven't were opened up, and a lot of people kind of theorize this as you know the start of the continental uh, drift or shift. Uh, you know, the uh, a lot of land mass moving about, uh, earthquakes of course here and there. Um, so if and even some point uh, to the point that some people theorize that the pressure, because from this humongous pressure some of the water from the earth actually you know, uh, hit 
the moon, creating the some of the crater on the moon. You know, not all of them, but you know, just some of them. It's a theory, but it does make sense in a way. So, um, I mean, basically, that's how great and deep <laughs> it was. You know, and meaning there were a lot of water uh, uh, beneath the surface of the Earth before it was broken up. Yeah, I would think that the, the Earth really was a much different in many different ways at that time. And uh, the idea of a canopy of uh, vapor in the air like uh, and, and uh, protection from the ozone layer and the idea that because of that all the creatures grew much older and much larger. And even even maybe man, man was much larger at that time because if animals had a, a much longer life and they continued growing because the environment was conducive for that, they could grow to great sizes and live a, a great number of years. Uh, Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah I'm in agreement also because it mentions that that's, that's a recent discovery. They've tried to poo-poo scientists for years, and they've suddenly, even the evolution scientists have discovered that, that there are actually fountains in the deep. There's still fresh water running now, you know, in the deep, pouring up into the seawater. So, you know, God wasn't lying when he gave this account to Moses. There, there was fountains of water under the earth. So not only was the flood, you know, coming from above, but it also came from below. And, and like I said, science has now proven that, and, and there's, there's no getting away from that. You know, they, they, they can argue a toss over the canopy theory if they want to, but the fountains of the deep and the water rushing in from under, under the earth it is now proven scientifically. Yeah, and before I go, um, it, oh, there had been some, uh, just like Brother Bill said, there had been some um, scientific discovery that there are more than enough water underneath the surface of the earth to cover uh, you know cover the whole earth entire earth so you know anyway uh, they're catching up with the uh, with the scripture <laughs> God bless you I'll talk to you later all right brother thank you for, for joining us uh, thank you uh, yeah, even the even the geography of the, of the Earth back in that time, it's uh, it's speculated that the whole layout of continents and mountains was totally different, and uh, for that reason, uh, in the Earth could have been covered up, uh, completely submerged in in water uh, more easily if the shape of the Earth was different too. So, uh, all right, but let's let's move on to the next verse if uh, you don't want to have anything to add to that. Uh, we're going to go to uh, I think we're now because we skipped but it's, we're on starting from verse 12 uh, 713 is what I was going to read next but uh, uh, you got uh, verse 12 something just what does verse 12 say it says and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where did you want to go from from thirteen down to? Oh, that we can go from thirteen down to sixteen, where you know, because I, I mentioned sixteen earlier, didn't I? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to go down to. Uh... Let's look at 13. In the same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Jepheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and all three wives of his sons with them entered into the ship. So it looks like, um, I don't know if they entered the ship before the water started or just when it started to rain, then they entered in. I'm, I guess they, it began to rain, then they entered in. Yeah, yeah, sounds sounds probably about right. Uh, and then 17, uh, 15, 7, 15, they went to Noah into the ship by pairs of all flesh with the breath of them in them. Uh, so this referring to the, uh, the animals entering into the ship. Uh, 
let's 716 uh, those who went in went in male and female of all flesh as God commanded him and Yahweh shut him in uh, I was watching something earlier today um, and they, the the uh, the Bible teacher was talking about um, you know how Satan and demons can possess people but but God can possess not only people but also animals too and how God possessed the the, the birds to, so that to feed the Israelites and sent them down and God possessed the the donkey to in order to speak uh, and uh, in this case I I can see that maybe that happened with all these animals God selected these pairs and he he uh, possess them or control them so that they would go there and uh, I'm saying obviously God can certainly compel an animal to 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 go into the boat however however he did it I don't know oh yeah we, we know he can because we even know that it just brought up where, where Christ you know commanded legion uh, that poor man and they went into the, in, into the swine. So, and Jesus was God, so we know that that, that is a perfectly legitimate and, and logical, you know, way of thinking. If, if Jesus himself, when he was earth, said, right, and, and he sent he sent legion into all these swine, then, then I'm sure that God himself could have, you know, by some miracle, because he's omnipresent, you know, got into these animals and made them do as he pleased. Yeah. Yeah, okay, uh, uh, so verse uh, 23, uh, 723, every living thing was destroyed that was on the surface of the ground, including man, livestock, creeping things, and birds of the sky. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ship. You know, we, we mentioned a verse earlier that um, uh, it made me relate back to Acts 16.31. When it said uh, uh, Noah entered in his ship and, and, and his family, uh, and uh, uh, there's in 1631 it talks about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and your family. Uh, so uh, th to me, there was a similar idea that uh, uh, look, Philippian jailer, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. And this salvation is available to your family too if they will do the same and so in that way uh god said noah enter in and you'll be saved and your family too if they're willing to come in i guess they didn't need to be talked into it <laughs> i'm assuming that they they were completely behind noah i don't i don't see anything in the scriptures that showed that there was any dissension or disagreement in the family though well no 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 i can't, I can't. yeah i can't at all <laughs> Um, okay, look at uh, chapter eight, verse one. God remembered Noah and all the all the animals and all the livestock that were with him in the ship, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. So we're we're jumping ahead to the part where he's uh, um, the flood is uh, going to die down now, and. Uh, so, uh, then Genesis 8, 6, it happened at the end of the 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ship, which he had made. Hmm. So I guess it stopped raining and the wind made the waters begin to subside. So finally Noah decides to open a window and for the first time, look out. Yeah. I probably would have been more curious to try to look out sooner, wouldn't you? I don't, I don't, I don't know if I could wait 40 days to look out the window. <laughs> yeah, old man, yeah, but we know what curiosity done, don't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, especially if, if, if it was sealed airtight, you know, you certainly don't want to open it up until the right time, I guess. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, Genesis 8, 7, Noah sent out a raven, which went uh, this way and that till the waters were gone from the earth. Uh, and then 8, 9, but the dove 
what happened? Where's the, where's the difference between a raven and a dove here? Uh, I, I don't have verse. Let me look at this in context here. Um, eight, nine. Uh, sent out a raven and it flew here and there until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. I, I never noticed that before, that he first sent out a raven, then he sent out a dove. I don't, do you see any significance in that? Well, I, I, only that uh, a dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit ain't gonna lie. Because we know later on the story, you know, that, that, that the dove flew out, didn't find rest, come back again. But when it flew out again and come back again, it brought the olive branch, which is symbolic of peace. So I think it's a picture of the Holy Spirit again and, and, and a picture of Christ, you know, the Prince of Peace. This is what's amazing about, you know, the, 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 even in the book of Genesis, these little things that are aptly put in there, which are historically accurate and happened, also at the same time are prophetic, and they speak of this Christ Saviour to come. That's what I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, we do think of the dove as, uh, you know, when Jesus was baptized, uh, uh, the scripture says that uh, uh, the, a, vo a voice from above said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then the Holy Spirit uh, ascended from Jesus in the manner of a dove. So some people think that it's uh, the spirit uh was it, it appeared as a dove a dove as you just said maybe the dove was visibly as a dove and, and it was representing the holy spirit but i think that that particular verse says it, it, it ascended in the manner of a dove in other words it was it ascended in in the same way that a dove would ascend the holy spirit ascended do you i don't have the verse right in front of me but do you have you ever um uh, noticed that no i've not noticed that no yeah yeah because uh you, you just you know said that i i don't know if there's other references can you think of other references where the dove and the holy spirit are identified together besides that one no only, only like i said only in regards to, to peace you know the holy spirit and the dove are very tightly close you know, related in regards to peace because even jesus says you know that we've got to be, you know, as boys as serpents and as peaceful or as placid, whatever translation you refer to as a dove. So dove is always symbolic, I suppose, as, as peace and as truth, which is what the Holy Spirit is. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's, uh, we, we see in Genesis 8-11, the dove came back to him. The dove was uh, returning to him. Uh, and the dove came back to him at evening, and behold, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, so no one knew that the waters were abated from the earth. So um, at least there was one point where the, that the dove was seen that uh, there was, was not submerged. Um, and then Genesis 8.13, it happened in the 600, 601st year. It happened in the 601st year in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from the earth. Noah removed the covering of the ship and looked. He saw that the surface of the ground was dried. Hmm. Isn't it interesting how precise that is with, with the dates? Hmm. I guess it's some people I think that they can actually uh, use the dates like that to to actually make an actual date in history. Have you ever seen anybody that uh, to, uh, believes that they can accurately 
count back the days and tell us exactly the day that this, these things happened. I, I personally, I don't know if that's possible to be that accurate as far as uh, you know projecting backwards. Brother Bill's having a problem, I guess. Okay. Um, then we'll look at Genesis 8.15. God spoke to Noah saying, uh, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your, and your wives with you. 14. Go out, go forth out of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl and of cattle, and the very creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiplied upon the earth. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast and creeping thing and every fowl and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. Yeah, I'm back again. I lost the internet connection again. As, um, this things are really flying up tonight. Yeah, well, I'm glad you can get back at least. Uh, you know, it's just temporary. Uh, so now we're at the point at, uh, let me see, I'm on, uh, uh, I've read the end of uh, uh, chapter, chapter 8, and they've landed, and God's directed them to go out and repopulate the earth. The animals and Noah and his family. Yeah, yeah, I'm reading that, reading that now. Yeah, what, what translation are you reading from, uh, Luke? Uh, I'm reading KJV right now. Uh, I've been, I, for some reason, uh, the setting on this Bible hub, it gives me some weird translation. But right now I'm, I'm strictly stick, trying to stick with the KJV here. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, so I'm just I'm just playing catch up because I lost when I lost uh, connection. I lost. Yeah, basically. Yeah, go, go to go to verse eight twenty. Yeah, 820. and there. Yeah, it says, and Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now, yeah. some people might say, well, there's a problem with that, All right? And can you, does any problem come to mind as, that you can see that a skeptic might use? Well, so, so if, if a skeptic hasn't read the Bible properly and in context, you know, they, 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 they might have had some Sunday school teaching and think that the animals went in two by two like the song. No, no, but if you read the, the actual Bible, it says all the clean animals, so he offered the clean animals one to be sacrificed, all the clean animals went in seven by seven and a lot of people forget that so you know if, if, if a skeptic or, a, or an atheist who hasn't read the bible just know the old noah nursery rhyme you think well hang on they went in two by two they're killing one of each so they ain't going to repopulate but the truth okay. is seven by seven the clean animals went in and and noah offered a clean animal from each of their kind which left six so that <laughs> That, that's the truth of the matter. That's why it's so important that people read the Bible and not listen to nursery rhymes. <laughs> okay, that's very good. That's that's what I was looking for, that, that particular answer that uh, a lot of what people would say, well, if they just get off the ark and the Noah is making sacrifices and killing animals, how could that particular species of animals repopulate the earth if Noah killed them? But as you said, uh, certain animals were not just two of them, but there were seven, seven of that kind. Let's say hi to Brother uh, Tommy here. Hello, how you doing, Brother Luke? And uh, Panda Man, how are you, Bill? 
Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're good. I'm actually Sunt Panda tonight. Oh, Sunt Panda. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I should say. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, he certainly looks saintly. Uh, I think he looks uh, even much better with that uh, long hair and that youthful face. Uh, so you would say this is long hair? I mean, it's longer. I haven't had a haircut in a while. No, I was talking about Bill and his. Oh, his, Bill! You see how he has that long hair? Oh, uh, like, yeah. <laughs> I do see that. I'm not sure I'm digging that look, really. <laughs> but <laughs> I guess it's all in the, uh, the eye of the beholder, I guess. Yeah. Well, if, if, it's either that or this. I don't know if you can see what poor old Luke had to put up with earlier. See if it's gone now. Hang on. <laughs> oh. Oh God. Yeah. Tommy, Tommy, you know, you, you tell him why I can't look at that. <laughs> Uh, is it moving? Yeah. <laughs> it, it was moving. I, I had my, my head moving on, on the... I don't know why it's still in there. It must be still in the cache because I got rid of that picture nearly two hours ago now. It still comes up every time. When he was when he put up that thing, and if you look in the comment section, uh, you can see on the last comment he put, Hello, Brother Tommy. You can see the icon there where the head's shaking. Right. I can't look at that. Remember what I told you about the motion? Yeah. Well, you got it bad. I thought my wife was bad, but you got it worse. You can't even watch anything on TV that moves. <laughs> yeah. I can't watch that, and, and I can't even think. If it's up there on the screen, I, I can't even think because it totally takes over my mind for some reason. Wow. Uh, okay, Tommy, uh, uh, we're just going through all the scriptures that contain the name Noah and just trying to discuss it and see what we can learn about Noah. Uh, have you listened to all yet, or I haven't. I I just sat down with the computer, saw you guys were actually saw my Skype, and um, saw you guys were on, and just thought I'd pop on and say hello and see what's happening. I can chime right. in maybe uh, occasionally, but yeah. So all right. uh, well, just, yeah, I'll give you a, you know whenever you feel like commenting, feel free. Uh, we're just right now at the point where uh, the flood is over, the mm -hmm. the, the ark has landed. And now the uh, Noah is told to uh, have the animals and the family repopulate the earth, and he makes uh, first thing he does is make an animal sacrifice. And I was just asking him if he sacrificed an animal, how could that animal reproduce? And right. Of course, a lot of people aren't aware of it, but Brother Bill pointed out that certain kinds were uh, brought into the ark in sevens rather mm -hmm. than two. So yeah, multiple. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, we'll go on. Uh, now we're at the uh, beginning of uh, chapter 9. I was going to just chime in. At the very first of when I came on here, you were talking about how they repopulated the earth. That's a big, that's a big topic and a big um, controversy. You know, a lot of the, uh, the long-agers or the anti-Christians like to hammer us over how in the world that might have happened. But it could very well be, well, there's a number of scenarios. But it could very well be that, that the earth was in the land masses were in a completely different figuration than they are now and or that where there is now water, there could have been land or land bridges or the continents could have been uh, together uh, in some places or in, in all places. Um, there's, there's lots of things out there that says that the um, – a lot of people have, have investigated this and – it seems to um, a, a lot of people that that there has been a major shakeup in the Earth's crust and, and configuration over really fairly recent history. So for one to speculate that that the continents have always been where they are right now, yeah, it would have been difficult for for animals to get from Africa to South America, you know, to cross that big ocean. But the problem is is people on the other side have the same issue. Um, you know, the, the evolutionists or the long ager, they have the same issue of how, how deer and bear of the same species and all these other thousands of different species got to corresponding coastlines. Um, and there's, there's, it's, it's a huge issue, but, you know, I was just going to point out that nobody knows what the landmass configuration was at that, at that time. You know, it could have uh, certainly changed since then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a valid point. We touched on that briefly earlier, but uh, one of the things I've seen now, I, and, and this is from the secular world that I saw this on some kind of a secular science show on TV, and they were just basically just showing how 
uh, the continents fit together like puzzle pieces. If you push them closer together, they, they just like match just like that. Right. And, uh, they, they talked about at the bottoms of the oceans, I forgot the terminology they used, but uh, they, they saw evidence that, the, that it was one land mass at one time. So right. science is, is now uh, actually uh, supporting that idea. Yeah, well, it's it's so it's so it's an unbelievably fascinating topic because even archaeology, they they go in and they you know they dig up all these these past civilizations on both coasts, like the African coast and the South American coast and the Mexican coast, and, and they can see that in a lot of cases there's a mirror image of the technology used from one side to the other. There's there's mirror. Um, religious customs and burial customs you know there's all kinds of things like pottery and, and things that sort of match as if they were conjoined or if, as if there was some sort of a connection and they were in on the same uh, technology and um, so it's it's a big thing it's very heretical to science to suggest that here within a few thousand years the land masses were connected mm -hmm. but that's but that's a lot of the evidence is pointing that direction, and what you're saying is absolutely true. I think uh, a lot of people sort of dismiss that that the that the land masses could have all been together and conjoined, and have since separated. <laughs> and and even Plato, you know, he uh, the whole thing about Atlantis, you know, that's a, that's a giant topic, but it all has to do with what you know islands or land masses that once were there are now gone and there has been oral tradition and legends passed down through the generations of of this happening of this major shakeup in the world that involved catastrophe and um, so it's hard to say exactly what happened there's a million and one different theories no there's nothing terribly scientific about it but there's a lot of evidence and a lot of facts that that point to the idea that the land masses weren't the same in the past as they are now well, you've also got, also got examples the other way, you know, where in re even in recent history, because of uh, volcanic you know, activity, new islands are being formed, left, right, mm -hmm. and centre. So we know that that, that that is feasible, it does happen. So you know, an island can be formed, so one can be lost. And we also have to, to bear in mind you know, that, that you know, the waters were receding. So it doesn't say how long it took for the waters to recede, you know, could have took 200 years, 300 years, in which time, you know, mankind could have gone to every single continent. Mm -hmm. Well, and all the animals. And then the land masses separated, and then that's how monkeys, for example, got to South America, you know, when, right. uh, you know, and all the other animals. They just, they simply walked there, and then the, then the land masses separated. That's one possibility. Uh, I think that actually makes the most sense. You know, some people posit that there were ways for animals to drift across the sea. I think that sounds really far-fetched. You know, the only other way is up through the uh, uh, the Siberian mountains of Russia, <laughs> up over the uh, Bering Strait, you know, where it's all freaking freezing cold, and that doesn't make a lot of sense for animals like, um, well, monkeys and... Uh, Hippos and all that doesn't make any sense, you know. So, yeah. and there's no, fo there's no fossil evidence of that either of, of those yeah. kind of animals being up there. Yeah. So I'll probably agree like you that that as the waters receded, you know, it weren't like over <laughs> literally overnight. They gradually receded, maybe mm. over a period of a few hundred years. By which case, all, all the creatures and all the mankind could have spread around the whole whole earth. Right. What's funny is is listening to the other side, the atheist or the the long ager, whatever you want to call them, for them to explain it because they've got to take out that idea of recent landmass separation because their theory is that the landmass is separated. They indeed separated, but it was like a hundred million years ago when that started. So they got to figure out a way. Just they got the same problem because the animals, the mammals, supposedly evolved long after that. Yet here they are, on, represented on both both all continents or most continents, and um, it's it's kind of funny because they have no answer. They they have to squirm, you know. So yeah. Anyway, I didn't want to get into a big tangent on that, but that's one of the topics that kind of interests me. Plus, there's the uh, there's the thing about civilizations all around the world 
uh, ancient civilizations that carried forward these customs and these these uh, customary dances and and remembrances of the flood. And um, some some civilizations, money has been found that they use for currency, like little you know old old old, very ancient coins that were made that on the coin uh, made reference to Noah and, and the ark. And so all this is chiseled into society, into different societies all around the world. This, this remembrance of the ark, everybody seems to remember it for the most part, with few exceptions. And um, so if you, if you want to disbelieve the flood, what you do is you listen to the scientific community because they, what they do is they drown or they just completely uh, put uh, blinders and ear, ear protection on so they can't hear anything that is spoken of from people who actually investigate real history and real archaeology and real ancient civilizations. They discount all of that uh, because if they did accept it, um, it, it would be perfectly clear and perfectly obvious that there's millions of different evidences flooding in from, from the past that point right to that. But they have to. They have to. They have to just ignore it. All right. The uh, beginning of uh, chapter nine. Uh, it, it talks about uh, Noah being told to repopulate the earth. So you had Noah and his wife. What was it, three sons and three wives? So that's six. There's eight people, right? And from eight people, now we have uh, over six billion people. Um, does uh, does the math work so that uh, we can get from eight to six billion in uh, when was the flood historically was that uh, five thousand years ago it wasn't I mean, we think of creation as six thousand years so it was the th the flood of uh, uh, no actually Noah was about six hundred years old at the flood and so there weren't there were many generations between Noah so I, I'm guessing that probably Noah's uh, it's less than a thousand years from creation. So if we go back to say five thousand years ago or a little more, in that period of time to go from eight people to six billion, do you do you think that the, the math works to populate the earth? Well, I mean, yeah, I think it does. And just think if 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 there's one thing that, that humanity has done and follow God's command on, it's to uh, be fruitful and multiply. We screwed everything else up, but we can do that. <laughs> so we, we managed to be able to to get with a, uh, you know, the, a member of the opposite sex and perform, perform that duty. Um, but, yeah, I think, um, I mean, look at the population here in the past 30 years. It's doubled. I mean, when I was in elementary school, I don't know why I remember this, but I remember reading geology or a geography book, and it was talking about how there were four billion. I think it was four billion people, and now I think it's close to seven. So in 30, 35 years, it's almost doubled. So you know, I don't know what the actual doubling rate is, but when you start doubling, you know, it doesn't take long for the numbers to start exponentially, you know, building. Yeah, and I would also say that uh, historically, people had a lot more children. Than we see people having today. I mean, mm -hmm. particularly the European c countries and uh, North America, our uh, birth rates are pretty low. But much of the world, the birth rate is really quite high. And in you know, centuries ago, even the European uh, countries were the, the birth rate. My, my parents had five children. My mother's family had sixteen children. So, but now I have one child. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're producing less and less uh, offspring. Uh, but uh, uh, throughout history, that was not the case. People had a lot of children. As a matter of yeah. fact, you were considered wealthy if you had a lot of children because you had a lot of people to work. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Now it's the opposite. If you have more kids, it's more expensive to raise your kids, and it actually costs you money and drains your wealth, whereas back in the old days, the more kids you had, the more hands you had on the farm or, or for, you know, Growing, growing stuff, working on, working on things, and so it's just the, the polar opposite now. Yeah, everything's been turned upside down. So, yeah. so yes. What's interesting as well is like uh, something that the evolutionists and, and people don't really regard is, you know, when you had 
Oh, Obviously, now are his wife, his three children, and their wives. You got to realise the gene pool was a lot stronger then, a lot healthier, because it, it is, and it is proven scientifically entropy. You know, over time things break down. So you've got to remember right back then, you know, the, the gene pool was really yeah. strong. You wouldn't have had so many, I supposed, uh, issues within the genes, so you wouldn't have had, you know, disabled people so often, you wouldn't have had all these issues that you have now. But because of the breakdown of the gene pool over the years, you know, life expectancy, although it's starting to go up now, it's only because of medication keeping us alive, because if you worked out, if, if you take away all the medication, all, all, all the advances in science we've got, you know, the average Joe on the street would probably die at 30. You know, you think someone, you know, like have appendicitis at 12. No medication, no doctors, you know, no no scientific advances. They'd be dead. Whereas in them days, the gene pool was stronger and you never had a lot of these issues. I bring that up because a lot of atheists say, well, isn't that ancestral? Isn't that bad? Isn't that going to, you know, produce, you know, you know, disabled children? Is that going to produce all this sort of problem? But it's not because the gene pool then was strong. And it even hints, doesn't it? where it talks about Noah being perfect in his genealogy. You know, there's a massive hint there. So his gene pool wasn't corrupted, and it was very strong and very good. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. I think the uh, the environment back then was different. Obviously, there, there were no chemicals and various things in the uh, the environment that, that act upon the organism. Uh, you know, smoke and smog and pollution and junk chemicals, all this stuff is really what's causing the gene, uh, the gene pool to really suffer now. But they didn't have any of that back then. So as, you know, kind of like what you were saying, it was, is it, it was more pristine. Uh, we were more pristine genetically anyway. So, um, but, but yeah. there were, yeah, those, the, the three sons and their wives. So there was a, a little variation there anyway. Yeah, plenty enough variation for them guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, I think the study of Noah can be concluded in one session uh, because there's only a few things I really think that need to be emphasized uh, that remain, and one is the the, the problem with Noah, uh, the, and then also the, finally the, uh, uh, the the fact that Jesus cited Noah. And so we're going to cover those two areas here, and then we'll be, we should be able to be finished with this. But let's look at this portion here where we get down to uh, verse 26. Let me see. This is uh, chapter 9, verse uh, 26. <clears throat> and it says, uh, And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and he was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Okay, let's talk about that uh, before we get to the final verses about the, the consequences of this. Uh, what do you think actually happened there? Well, firstly, I do find it amusing because it goes against Lordship Salvation and this holy and now people, that, that the first thing that Noah decided to do was, was plant his vineyard and get absolutely blotted out of his head. That that I find that I find amusing, because you know often they times these these holy and now say that Jesus and the disciples and obviously no they only drink grape juice. What a load of rubbish! This was wine and he got he got smashed out of his head. But but silliness aside, but I think that, that it was a heart issue. You know, it, Ham was almost making like and making fun of his father being naked because he was so blotto. But his other sons had a little bit of respect, and and they even went backwards and they covered the father's nakedness. Whereas obviously Ham found it most amusing, and, and he was making fun, I believe. 
Uh, uh, Tommy, do you do you have any interesting insights on that incident, or, or any different than bro uh, Brother Bill? Um, you know, I just I find it odd. This is one of those things where you read it, and they've just included some of these details that, you know, it, it makes you. It, it, to me, it just makes it ring true because why would they make that up? You know, someone's going to make up a story. Why would they make that up? Because A, that doesn't make Noah look, you know, like some sort of a saint, obviously. So if you're going to make up a story and you're going to lie or, uh, uh, you know, try to exaggerate the truth, why would, you, why would your um, central character be a drunk? You know, um, that's, that's the first thing I, I pulled from it, but... Yeah, as to why I'm I'm just read ahead a little bit, but it's just said why I, I'm I'm not understanding why he would curse his son for what he did. I mean, unless he was embarrassed, you know. Sometimes if you do something that you are embarrassed for, and someone catches you doing it, maybe you might strike out at them for some reason, you know. But I I I, I was reading that I've read it before, but it just reminded me that it kind of seems. Like it doesn't follow. Like, why would he get mad at his son yeah. for, for covering him up? That's what I'm. Uh, that's what I was looking for. Uh, someone to to say it seems like uh, uh, the consequences of this are really quite uh, severe. So, wondering what really happened here, and uh, I'm going to pose a uh, um, a um, an explanation. From, that I learned from Dr. Peter Ruckman. Uh, he, he, Peter Ruckman is well, well known for being the, maybe the, the, the king of KJV onlyists. And, and uh, he is a brilliant man. I've got about 40 of his books and, and many of his commentaries. And when he was talking about this scene here, he, he put it in a way that I found uh, pretty amazing. And uh, but I, I, I want to just get your reaction to this, okay? So he, he says that when it says that um, Ham saw his father naked, that there's more to it than just seeing him, um, that he actually sodomized him. And by the way, what I'm saying now is not some, it's not an idea exclusive to Dr. Ruckman. A lot of people, uh, you know, read this into it somehow. Uh, that he sodomized his father. And that was such a serious thing that that's the reason he got cursed. And uh, that's the reason that his descendants were cursed as, as we read further. But it doesn't really fit to me as I'm looking at these verses. And let's look at it carefully. It says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. So why would he tell his brothers if he had sodomized him, it seemed like he would not, not want to be broadcasting it. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their sh uh, shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And, awoke, and, and Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So it's kind of conflicting as I'm reading this as far as... Uh, it doesn't fit when, in terms of, it just says that he saw his father's nakedness, and then he told his brothers about it, and his brothers wouldn't look at his nakedness, and, and then, but Noah, when he woke up, he, he when he realized what his son had done to him, uh, he he was very very upset. Uh, so. It doesn't seem to fit to me that he had sodomized him, and yet the consequences were really quite severe. Let's look at the remaining verses here. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. Now, Canaan is the son of, uh, of Ham. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So this is where Dr. Ruckman comes to the conclusion that the descendants of Ham and Canaan would be servants of Shem and Japheth. And so if we look at the rest of verses, it says, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be a servant. Now Shem, uh, well, let me see. I don't know if it says it right here. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, 
and Canaan will, shall be his servant. Uh, and Noah lived, uh, well, okay, then Noah died. But uh, Dr. Ruckman says this is telling us that uh, Ham sodomized Noah, Noah cursed him and his descendants, and because of that, Ham and Canaan's descendants would end up serving Shem and Japheth's descendants. And then it says that they, I think if we go forward, it might say this, uh, at least Dr. Ruckman says that Shem was sent to populate the eastern part of the world, and from, the, from Shem's descendants came uh, the eastern people, uh, you know, the, uh, is, is, uh, the Middle East and the Far East, uh, like China, India, and the Middle East. And and then, but uh, Japheth was sent north, and from Japheth came the European people, and then uh, Ham was sent south, and south goes deep into Africa, and we became the the African race of people. So Dr. Ruckman is saying that you see that Ham's descendants all went to south in Africa, and these people end up being the servants and the slaves of the Europeans, the uh, of Japheth. So that's how he explains it, but it, it doesn't really, um, it doesn't really, uh, not, I'm not that convinced of that, but that's interesting. Have you ever heard that before? I've not heard, no, no, I've not heard that one before, yeah. to, be, to be honest with you. No, no, like maybe it sort of goes a little bit too far with it, sort of noise and his father and that not, but certainly we know that in reading in context, you know, you, you can see quite clearly he was, he was, he was mocking his father and he, and he was having a, a jolly moment about doing it because he, he expressed it straight away to his brothers. <laughs>
it does seem to me that it, it's kind of overkill if he just happened to see his father naked and all he did was just see him. It seems that being cursed and all of his descendants being cursed to serve the other brothers, it's kind of overkill if, if it was only he saw. But on the other hand, if it, as Rudrachman says, that he sodomized Noah, then Noah could be very upset about that. But I don't want to see the reaction from the brothers when, when, when uh, Ham told his brothers that he saw him. I don't see any, the kind of reaction that I would expect. Tommy, have you ever, ever heard anything about this? No, not that particular hypothesis. I think it's dangerous to add stuff like that, but I think, you know, there's something to that. Like I was saying before, and what you echoed, is that it doesn't really fit, doesn't really follow, that just simply seeing him naked would, would evoke that sort of reaction. So something else may have happened. There may have been a history there. But the one thing I was thinking about this was it kind of, it kind of, it's easy to just skim over it that, yeah, Noah cursed him. And, um, but that would lead credence to the idea that Noah could actually curse him and cause the descendants of one to be the slaves of the other. So, I mean, I look at that and it's like, that's, that's pretty powerful if he, if he has that sort of ability or some sort of, that sort of power. So, I mean, that's one of the things that kind of popped out of me. Um, that um, that indeed, you know, he can he can manipulate the future like that. So, but yeah, I think there's there's something missing here. Obviously, whether it be some sort of a past issue with the relationship or something within that event itself that's not spoken. But having said that, I think it's kind of dangerous to to assume there was sodomy or something like that. There's just, there's just yeah. no way of, no way of knowing. I'm not uh, I'm not endorsing it at all. I'm just bringing it up because I yeah. Know, uh, uh, it was in a, in his book, and other people must have read the book, and there are probably people who hold to it, and and there's there's holes in it. But on the other hand, um, it does say that they were cursed. I mean, Ham and Canaan were cursed, and they'd be servants of the other brothers. Um, so I don't know. Um, well, it may have been. I mean, it could have been some sort of a milder version of that, like. You know, being naked back then, um, cult cultures are different. Maybe, maybe you know, covering yourself up or exposing yourself rather was a big, you know, a big no-no, a big sin. Uh, maybe his son knew he slept naked or, or was naked, and maybe this had happened before. Maybe the son was just in there looking at him, watching him. Uh, maybe didn't stoop to sodomy, but you know, if he was in there watching him or whatever, maybe that was it. So. Yeah. But the, and that and that that scenario would not contradict what this, or even expound uh, expand on what the Bible says here. You yeah. know, if you wake up and see somebody watching you or looking at you sleep while you're naked, that's kind of creepy and weird and immoral. So, yeah, there's. Uh, I find it interesting too that there's no uh, negative um, uh, negative I thing attached to Noah getting drunk and passing out. Uh, but there is a negative consequence because he got either seen by a son uh, or or worse and and uh, it result from being getting drunk and passing out uh, but I suspect that uh, that probably wasn't the only time Noah ever got drunk and drank wine too much and passed out but it's interesting how when Noah did that there was this constant this problem that came about from it and then there's also who was it that uh, Got drunk and then his daughter. Uh, Lot, that's a lot, lot. Yeah, twice. It, 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 within a space of a few, they got absolutely blotto again. Slept with these daughters and then produced the two worst races that mankind's ever known. That's Lot. Yeah, who was that? That was Lot. Lot oh. and his daughters. Yeah, flat. Yeah, okay. So uh, I guess one thing we can learn is that you know if you get drunk and pass out. There's no telling what bad things can happen after that. Yeah. Uh, what is what is interesting though is that both. I know it sounds peculiar, but I've, I'm sure God puts a fly in the ointment every now and then just to just to shut up the holy of nails. You have Noah who got absolutely blotted. All right, he wasn't condemned for it, yet his son was for making fun of him. And you got Lot was absolutely blotted, 
he wasn't condemned for it, but they're obviously the two children who bore cruel racist work. So you had two cases of both Lot and Noah getting absolutely blottoed, and the Bible describes both them people as righteous men. Interesting, isn't it? Oh, well, look at David. I mean, the Bible's full of them. Uh, look at Paul. Uh, you know, murderer. <laughs> you know, persecutor of Christians. Look at Peter. He denied Christ three times. I mean, the Bible is just full of these shady, you know, well, shady, yeah, shady characters and flawed, I guess is a better word, flawed characters all throughout the Bible. So, again, kind of hearkening back to what I was saying earlier, you know, the fact that he, that God did use just normal people who had flaws, again, is, to me, lends credence to the idea that, that what we're reading is an actual account of what actually happened. And it's not something that was, you know, constructed out of whole cloth just for the fun of it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's uh, let's conclude with reading these verses that we find in the New Testament that, that uh, use the name Noah. And what I want to try to drive home with these verses, I'm just going to read them all very quickly. And that is that um, p some people who question the uh, Noah and the flood account, uh, and they believe they say they believe the New Testament and they believe in Jesus, and yet they question. Uh, Noah and the flood. So I, I'm not sure how that's possible if we if we look at the New Testament and see who is quoting Noah. So we'll start with Matthew 24:37. Uh, As the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Uh, that's uh, I believe that's Jesus speaking there. Uh, Matthew 24:38. For as in those days which were before the flood. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ship. I believe that's Jesus also speaking. And then we got Luke 3.36. The son of Canaan, the son of Arphas, exact, Zad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech. So here in Luke, we have this genealogy quoted. These are real people, and, and that's the actual uh, genealogy. Uh, Luke 17, 26, as it happened in the days of Noah, even so it will, will it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, and then Luke 17, 27, they ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ship and the flood came and destroyed them all. Uh, let me stop there. There's a few more we'll cover, but I'll, I'll stop at this point here. And let me get your reaction based upon the point I'm making here. that. How is it conceivable that someone can accept the New Testament, accept Jesus as being, you know, God and Savior, and then and then knowing these things that are stated in the New Testament, challenge, they go challenge this uh, account of Noah and the flood. It's a good question. You're talking about people nowadays, correct? Yeah. That's him. That's a good question. I don't know how you can pick and choose and you know what what you want to believe and what you don't out of the Bible or the New Testament. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm probably a bad person to ask. <laughs> but there's a lot of them out there do, that do it, and the and the Bible does say that that people it, people will um, you know in the future people will start to doubt and disbelieve the flood, and that's sure enough coming to fruition. It's, it's amazing. Even Christians. You know, I understand the atheists doubting it or denying it. But but I don't understand the um, what the motivation is for Christians to disbelieve it. So, But but usually people who disbelieve the flood, they also, you know, have a tendency to disbelieve other things, you know, such as Adam and Eve being actual legit, uh, real people or the virgin birth. You know, they, they have a tendency to disbelieve various different things in the Bible that, that um, you know are are not are not allegory or not not written as allegory. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and you can whether it's the Noah and the flood, or whether it's uh, Adam and Eve and the fall of man. You we see in the New Testament cases where Jesus, Paul, Peter, and they are quoting the Old Testament about these things. Uh, so you can't really have it both ways. 
<coughs> you can't you say you believe in the New Testament, you believe in the apostles and then Jesus, and, and then discount the other because Jesus and the apostles are quoting mm -hmm. these, these events from the Old Testament. Brother Bill? Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking up the verse at the moment. So if you carry on talking amongst yourself just for a minute, there is a particular verse that I believe is fundamental, and I'm just going to try and get it up so I, I, and paste it on onto the chat. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. Well, I'll just just to expound on what I was well saying earlier about how science, you know, they discount everything that the old, the old the, the ancient people say legends and everything. I've got a book from Donnelly uh, called Atlantis and um, he's talking one of the chapters in here in his books is about uh, the, the flood legends of around the world and anyway he goes through all these different legends and, and not all of them but a lot of them scores of them and, and talks about different aspects of them and this is written back in I believe in the 1800s if I'm not mistaken uh, no uh, I know this version is in 1949. Anyway, it was written, I think it was the 1800s, before a lot of this political nonsense has, you know, emerged with creationism and evolutionism. I mean, he was just, you know, he was at, a, he lived at a time when I'm sure there was some, some disagreement over this stuff, but it wasn't near the fever pitch that it is now. But anyway, uh, on 78, page 78, after this kind of going through all these little lots of legends from around the world he goes no one can read these legends and doubt that the flood was an historical reality it is impossible that in two different places in the old world remote from each other religious ceremonies should have been established and uh, per perpetuated what's the word <laughs> uh, perpetuated uh, from age to age in memory of an event which never occurred uh, yeah he goes on but it's it's uh, when you get into the actual archaeology and the actual investigations of the of the ancients, then it becomes clear that this is not a made up story. It's coming the the, the belief and the um, the memory are the memories are coming from everywhere, and um, the people who who deny the flood are the ones that have to they have to play like an ostrich, and they have to dig a hole. Or at least the ostriches in the uh, in the cartoons, mm -hmm. and, and stick their head in the hole, you know. And they have to cover their ears and blind themselves, um, yeah. and they have to they have to not investigate uh, anything that is not from a peer reviewed article in Science. Anything else, they have to ignore. Yeah, I've just found that verse, and it's in John, chapter five, verse forty six. And, and this is Jesus himself speaking, and he says, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And we know that Moses wrote the first books in the Bible. Okay? So that accounts for the, the creation, and it accounts for the flood, and, and so much more. So if, if you deny that, that, that there was a creation by God, six days it says in the Bible, you know, you can argue a toss the gap through, I don't mind, but evolution is out of the question, and, and he categorically mentions of this worldwide flood that destroyed, you know, destroyed, you know, humanity and all the creatures, save for that what was in the ark. If you don't believe that, then you cannot believe Jesus because he wrote of Jesus. So Jesus was confirming what Moses wrote, and Moses always pointed the way to Christ. This is the issue I have with. You know, evolutionists and people who deny the flood and the six-day creation. Yeah, they're calling him a liar, basically. Basically, yeah, yeah, basically. Let me uh, let me read these remaining verses here, and then we'll we'll conclude this. Uh, um, it says uh, uh, Hebrews eleven seven by faith Noah being warned about things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared a ship for the saving of his house, through which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So the writer of Hebrews, I believe is the Apostle Paul, but not everyone agrees with that, but the writer of Hebrews is citing the Noah uh, account, and, and therefore 
uh, if we if someone says they believe the New Testament, then they they they, they have, what are they going to do? Remove this verse in First Peter three twenty, who before were disobedient when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ship was being built. In it, few that is eight souls were saved through the water. So we have P Paul in Hebrews, Peter writing here, and then Peter says also in Second Peter two five. And didn't spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah with seven others, a preacher of righteousness, when he brought a flood on the world of the ungodly. So those are, we've, we've basically covered uh, every verse where the name Noah is mentioned. There's a lot more we could learn if we were going to be more thorough uh, studying, uh, you know, Noah uh, in between the lines. But we just looked at the verses that have the name Noah in it. And... Uh, my question here, that then we'll end up in the show here for today, is uh, there are people who would say that it's impossible for someone to not believe in the creation account or not believe in the flood and Noah, uh, and, and say they would say that those people. Uh, their their Christianity and their salvation is questioned or impossible because they don't agree with that. Or someone, let's say, who believes in uh, Darwinian evolution, and, but and yet they believe God used Darwinian ev evolution as a means of creating man, even though we know in the Bible it says that's not so. In, in the Bible, we have a creation account, and it doesn't agree with Darwinism. So. What about someone who professes faith in Jesus, and they believe this gospel, we believe, and yet they believe in, uh, what? what's the ter proper term, uh, intelligent design, where there is a God and he designed things, but he used Darwinism as the means of it, or they believe in the gospel as we do, and they believe that the flood is just a myth. Um, would you say that those people, their their Christianity is in question, or or would you say that that they, they, they you can be wrong about those things and yet you're still a Christian? Well, I, I would like to get your reaction to that. I'll just quickly say is yes, you you can be saved, and people are saved by the the, the bare brass tacks of the gospel message. That's true because Christ makes it clear and apparently so. But, you know, it's not a but in regard to their salvation. It's certainly a but and a question mark in regard to that, that faith in this Christ being as as milk as opposed to meat. You know, it's a, it's a milk-meat issue. It is also a divisive issue if you don't grow from faith to faith, strength to strength. It causes a lot of problems, you know, but like I said, at the end of the day, it, I think the point you're aiming at and, and trying to get me to say is, is basically, yes, you can be saved if you're an evolutionary theist, but I do honestly believe in my heart you are lacking faith. You are lacking faith in, the, in regard to what Christ has said. Yeah, you have the initial faith, which is all you need to be saved. But if you continue on this path of, of of not believing, you know, God's creation, not believing in the flood and certain other things, and, and picking and choosing what scriptures you like, you're going to stone milk forever, and you're not going to be a good witness. You're really not going to give a true and honest account as as a proper Christian should. So my advice then is 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 pack it in. Get on board, believe what, what Moses wrote, because Moses wrote the truth and it was given by God himself and Christ even endorsed what Moses wrote. So come on, get on board and start having some meat, getting your faith strengthened and stop being so silly. That's, that's what I would say. All right, brother. Uh, okay, I'm going to expound on that after I ask Brother Tommy to react to answer my question, please. Um, I would just sort of reflect or re mirror what what Bill said I would I would say that you know you can be saved and be wrong you know there's lots of doctrinal issues and um, you know people 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 can be uh, believe and, and be saved by the blood of Christ and and just simply be incorrect um, but having said that 
there's something there's something beautiful and there's something that is um, truthful about you know this book and when you put your faith in the Word of God um, all of it and you take it's it's one of the beautiful things I think about God's Word it's like for me it's like it's either true or it's not if you either accept it or you reject it that's it and so when you put your when you put your faith in in God and you and you take this word this book and this this um, this word of God by faith there's there's something beautiful about that that will will bless you and you know for whatever reason uh, there are people that they just they, they want to believe their own their own gospel when it comes to the creation of the world um, and I think what Bill said is correct I think it's I think it's harmful to them and for them and um, it's something they need to pray about and work through um, because it's a false gospel um, at least that end of it that aspect of it but yeah I mean just to sum up I think sure I think um, ultimately the um, belief in Christ you know yeah, it, that that he is the the one who died on the cross and rose again after three days. He is the savior. I think that is what what saves people, and not necessarily believing in the flood or believing in some of these other issues. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think you both did it very well. Uh, Brother Tommy says you can be wrong and still be saved, and uh, it's true. You can be wrong about all kinds of uh, uh, theological questions, uh, and, and uh, creation and the flood are two of many things that a person could be wrong about, and yet they're still saved if they have their faith in the Savior. Um, and yet, I think that if they don't agree on these things, it's an indication to me that they are ignorant to a certain extent because if they really understood how everything fits together, it's intellectually incompatible uh, to, to not to believe in Darwinism and then and uh, and uh, because uh, it negates the whole idea of, of the fall of man and sin entering the world and death entering the world. And if you don't believe in Noah and the flood account, then 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 you know, it's intellectually incompatible because Jesus and Peter and Paul they all cited it as a fact. So these things, even though it, uh, they don't really make sense for someone to, to uh, uh, disagree on these things, they can, be di they can disagree. It's not a salvific issue. And now that we're getting to the question of salvific issues, uh, Brother Bill, would, would you mind telling everybody right now, what is the salvific issue? What is the one issue that, that is salvific? Well, the basic one issue is if you want to be saved this day, is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that shall be saved. It's really that simple. Yeah, yeah. there's plenty of different uh, areas that, that we should agree on and we ought to agree on, you know, as faithful servants and faithful witnesses. But but not every, not every saved person is a disciple. Not every saved person is on me. So... You know, this is why I think it's important that, that you, Brother Luton, and us on this panel today have distinguished between salvation and maturity. You know, the, the, the bare bones are, is, is the word says, you know, all have sinned and come short or fallen short of the glory of God. And sin means basically to miss the mark. God is so holy, so perfect and so righteous. And, 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 and like I said, and I've said this many a times, even on our most best day, we fall well short of that. You know, this is God's holy requirements. And unfortunately, the wages of this sin is death, which is separation from a loving God. You know, that is, that is the, that's the bad news. But the good news is, despite us all being yeah, sinful and falling short, and despite the wages of sin being death, the gift of God this day is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, that is, that is the good news, and that is actually the gospel. Despite our shortfalls and our shortcomings and our silliness and our, you know, our, our foibles and erroneous ways, God loves us dearly. And 2,000 years ago, he came to earth, and he came down to make a payment that we could never pay. You know, he lived a, a perfect and righteous life. And that's what God requires. Perfection. 
and total righteousness. You're gonna get one. But what Christ did when when he came to earth, he was perfect. He was righteous. Never committed a sin and lived absolutely brilliantly all the way through his life. Totally perfect. And what happened when he died at Calvary? There was what 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 some in Christian circles called is the great exchanged. Now he exchanged his perfect righteousness at Calvary at the cross for our imperfect record. And there was an exchange that took place. And this exchange is available for every single person that is alive today. If you used to believe on Christ this day, he would exchange his perfect record, his law keeping, his perfect behaviour, his perfect everything for our imperfections and our law breaking and our sins and our erroneous ways. He is offering this day the great exchange for every single creature. And all we need to do is very simple. We just need to believe that he done this for us because he loves us. No other reason. He doesn't have to. He created us. You know, he didn't choose to come to earth and die for us and make payment for our wrongs and sins, you know, because he, he was obliged to. He done it because he loved us. And he loves us that much that he would be prepared to do that. Now, if you was to believe the fact that he done that for us personally, that is, he paid for our sins and he died, that he was buried, and, and also, very importantly, that he rose again from the dead, showing that he had power over sin, death, and hell itself. And it, not only could he raise himself from the dead, being the first fruit, he could also raise every single creature, every single person today that would put their trust and faith in, in those facts you know this is the bare minimum you know we, we could expound for hours but we're not going to you know on propitiation on the atonement and all all other manner of theological debates but the bare bones is is that jesus loves you today he paid for all your sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and he rose again victorious the third day according to the scriptures if you was to believe on those bare bound facts and whom they brought which is jesus christ <coughs> you will be saved you will pass from death unto life. You will pass from being a sinner and a wretch to be a perfect, righteous man, being imputed by Christ's righteousness of himself. And this is, to me, this is the best news in the world. This is a win-win situation. You can't lose with Christ. You know, if, if you're ever going to edge your bets on anything in this life, I pray now that you would edge them towards and in Christ. Because you've won if you do so. You know, Christ is God Himself manifest in the flesh. If He has promised this day that you will receive eternal life by just simply believing Him and then facts, that is exactly what it means. So I pray now, put your bets on Christ, become a son of God, and just enjoy life most abundantly. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we all say amen. We we all say hallelujah. Yeah, it is good. Not only good news, it's, it is the best news. It is the, the greatest story ever told. It's the greatest love story. And uh, I hope anybody who's listening to this now uh, realizes that how much God loves us and how available this relationship and eternal life is. It's, it's there for your, your taking. If you just come to Jesus and say, I want salvation, he'll give it to you. All right. I want to thank the panelists for participating uh, in this discussion about uh, Noah I th thought it was very interesting and uh, I w we can continue talking privately once I close this live broadcast but uh, so uh, if you do put your faith in Jesus today if you heard this good news and you're joyful and and uh, you want to receive eternal life please make a comment on this video so that we know about that thank you for watching and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.